welcome to Evensong. This is our last week of our series on seasons of suffering in scripture. It's been a hard but meaningful journey to dig into these really difficult stories in the Bible. These are stories where the ending hasn't always been happy, where God doesn't sweep in with a perfect solution, the end to the hard things that we face in life. Rather, he reveals himself to be the one he has named himself to be, merciful, abounding in steadfast love, never leaving or forsaking us. These past four weeks, we've talked about Hagar, Naomi, Elijah, and Leah. If you've missed any of those episodes, I'd love for you to go back and listen, because each person's story has taught us something about God's faithfulness, no matter our life circumstances. I've been so moved each week, and I love that Evensong seems to be doing the very thing that we prayerfully hoped it would, framing our hearts, understanding God's character to be so good and true no matter what happens to us over the next seven days. Today, to wrap up our series, I was going to talk about Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, whose story is another powerful testimony of suffering and God's presence in it. But as I thought more and more about it, I felt the Holy Spirit prompting me to go in another direction, to reflect more and more on what it means to be women and men who suffer today. I'll close tonight with a prayer of lament and confession that I offered at the Christ Presbyterian Church in Cool Springs worship service on Sunday about the tragic shootings in Atlanta last week, which targeted women of Asian American descent. But in the prayer, I also lamented what it is to be a woman today. And goodness, it seems like every time I turn on the news, I'm confronted with that reality. The idea that because of the way God designed me and made me, I'm less safe. I have less of a voice. I'm less confident, less secure, less sure every time I leave my house to go for a run by myself or if I'm running low on gas or if I'm coming home by myself to an empty house. Think about some of the stories that have been on the news just in the last few weeks. The one year anniversary of Breonna Taylor's awful and unnecessary death. The murder of a 33 year old woman walking home one evening by herself in London. The killing of Asian American women in Atlanta. The shockingly unequal weight room at the NCAA women's basketball tournament that went viral on the internet this week. The protests about women's rights in Turkey, the jailing of women's rights activists in Saudi Arabia, the almost unbelievable statistics about how disproportionately women have been affected by the pandemic in terms of employment, finances, and stress. We lament the ways it's hard to be a woman today, you'll hear me say when I read this prayer to you. And when I wrote that, I meant it. But I could just have easily filled in that blank with a hundred other nouns. It's hard to be a Christian today. It's hard to be a moral person today. It is hard to be a person of color today. It is hard to be a conservative today. It is hard to be a liberal today. It is hard to be a daughter, a son, a mother, a father, a single person, a married person. It's hard to be employed today. It's hard to be unemployed today. It's hard to be sick today or to be a caregiver. But you know what's hard? life. It's hard to be alive in a broken world. And when we so and we so often look to God to give us a happily ever after. And when we do that, our dissatisfaction and fear and discontent, they grow. Suffering is unavoidable. It's the cost of participation in this beautiful and messy and extraordinary and hard life. One theme that has shown up repeatedly through the stories that we've discovered together, the stories of Hagar and Naomi and Elijah and Leah, is that God always appeared in their season of sufferings. His presence changed the story. It didn't always change the outcome of the story. It didn't always save someone from a life that was hard or hard and then it became beautiful or a life that was beautiful and then experienced great suffering. But it did change the way that people suffered. As believers, we suffer with hope and we never suffer alone. Let's spend a few minutes tonight in Isaiah 53 as we look forward to Easter next week. 
Isaiah 53 is the passage where God reveals that the Messiah will be a suffering servant, that King Jesus will suffer mightily for us. Isaiah 53 verses 1 through 5. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and had no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. I love this passage. It's hard to hear and hard to read. But our Jesus was a man of sorrows who was intimately acquainted with grief. He was a man of our sorrows who was acquainted with our grief. He didn't go to the cross not knowing what your face looked like or what my face looks like or how many tears we would cry. He took all of that with him. And because of that, our suffering is, is not a thing to run from or hide from or try to keep at arm's length. Jesus willingly entered into suffering for us because it was only through suffering that we would be healed forever, free from all pain and all tears. Throughout these four stories, we saw God carry the sorrows of specific people, but in Isaiah, God promises to send Jesus, who would carry all the sorrows of all people who believe. We studied suffering leading up to Easter because it makes us remember the cost of our suffering was borne by our suffering King. Okay, to close this week, our last even song until after Easter, I want to read this prayer from last week. This prayer of lament, this crying out about very specific suffering in our world. I pray that these words give you pause and perspective, and that when we pray them together, we leave them at the feet of our King who suffered for us, so that these sufferings and any sufferings that we have in this life will not have the final say over us, and that we will never feel like we carry them alone. Because when Jesus went to the cross, he carried our sorrows acquainted with our grief. Pray with me. Father God, we come to you today with a mix of exhaustion and hope. We praise you for the advancement of science and medicine that have led us into the third and prayerfully final act of COVID-19. We thank you for the ways you have worked in our lives, in our church, in our community, and around the world in the midst of this global tragedy. We lament the loss of more than 500,000 image bearers in the United States and the more than two and a half million worldwide. We praise you for protecting our congregation, for the family of Christ Presbyterian Church, for healing those among us who have been afflicted by COVID-19 and providing the common grace of technology to allow us to worship, connect, and serve together while we've been socially distant. But God, we lament the fractures our church, our community, and our society have felt this year. We lament the increase of violence toward the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. We condemn the use of harmful, hateful rhetoric against them. We specifically praise you for the gift of our AAPI brothers and sisters, especially in our own congregation and we lament the unjust targeting they have felt as a result of their heritage and race. We condemn racism, sexism, and cultural stereotypes, both individual and systemic. We weep for the families and friends of the precious eight lives lost in Atlanta last week as a result of violence, sexism, racism, and disordered sinful patterns. 
We lament the loss of 10 lives in Boulder, Colorado this week. God, we lament the systemic and individual sin that led to those brutal murders. We grieve the lives lost and the wounds against your beloved image-bearing children. We lament disordered and unbiblical perspectives on sex and sexual temptation and the ugly fruit of those perspectives when it becomes sexual violence, when it turns women into objects to be avoided or eliminated rather than image bearers to be equally respected. We cry out for justice, mercy, and healing. We cry out for you to return soon, Jesus. We lament the ways it is hard to be a woman today. We lament the violent murder of the young woman in Great Britain last week and the resulting protests in the streets of London. We lament the loss of Asian American women in Atlanta. We lament femicide in Latin America, the jailing of women's rights activists in Saudi Arabia, and the fears facing ordinary women in our community. We lament any theology, sociology, or cultural construct that sees women as objects to possess and control rather than full image bearers, heirs to the riches of the kingdom of God. We praise you, the God who sees and loves and trusts and empowers women. You are the God of Hagar, of Marion, of Ruth and Naomi, of Esther, of Deborah and Jael, of Mary, the mother of Jesus, of the woman at the well, of the Samaritan woman, of Phoebe and Lydia and Priscilla, all women who encountered God, all women who acted, taught, loved, and believed in Yahweh or in Jesus, the Messiah all women who were protected, loved, and saved by God. God, we confess the many ways our own sin clouds our view of our neighbors. We lament the sin that lives inside us, the sin that causes us to love ourselves more than our neighbors, that causes us to seek our well-being over the well-being of our city, our country, and our world. We lament the cost of our sin. We lament the suffering it causes. We confess it is often easier for us to speak than to listen. It is easier for us to post or retweet than to reflect deeply into our own hearts, our own minds. We confess we often jump on short-term bandwagons rather than doing the long-term work of reordering our hearts and retraining our minds. We confess that we are quick to dismiss and slow to learn. Father, forgive us. Holy Spirit, work in us. Jesus, be near to us. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. And um, for the last four weeks, we're going to take a little break. There won't be a new Even Song on Easter Sunday. Um, but beginning after Easter Sunday, uh, we're going to do a seven-week series for Eastertide, uh, which is the next season of the church calendar between Easter and Pentecost. And we're going to talk about prayers of God's people. So we're going to look at some really specific and beautiful prayers throughout Scripture and how they teach us to pray, which is something I certainly know that I need, and I'm really looking forward to developing this series and sharing it with all of you. Uh, thanks again so much. Happy Easter. He is risen.